and um, this is the title of the presentation, Sand Creek, Meaning and Power of Repentance. Um, the first reading is from Genesis 2, chapter 9. At the very beginning of the Bible, we were given this description of the tree of life. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And in Revelation 22, 2, we again see the tree of life. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. To begin to start to understand Sand Creek, we have to understand the evil that is in our lives. And the evil that's in the hearts of men. It's not a happy story. It is not a happy ending. It is fraught with peril. And with hearts broken and lives shattered. At the time, the northern Arapaho and the northern Cheyenne living living peaceably in southern Colorado along the Rockies near the parks called the Garden of the Gods. A beautiful place. But as they started to find natural resources like gold and silver, it awakened an evil hunger in the hearts of men. And so they told the Arapaho and the Navajo to leave the good lands with good water. And they made treaties with the chief black kettle. And they told them to go to Sand Creek. This, as you can see, not a lot of trees, right? Not a lot of grass. But the people knew that the reason it's called Sand Creek is because there's water underneath the surface. And if you dig a trough in the creek, it will fill up overnight with water. And you can then water your horses and your animals. And you can take good water yourself. So they knew that they could survive there. And they knew that they could make it through the winter there. And so there they were. The flag is the, uh, the American flag. And underneath it is the white flag of peace. And this was the symbol that Black Kettle raised over the camp to show everyone that they were at peace with the United States. Let me hit the next slide, just to press a button. So here's the historical context. Again, Black Kettle and the Arapaho and the Cheyenne <coughs> are at peace. They're not raiding. They're not attacking anyone. They are waiting. Waiting for the treaties to be finalized. And then enters, unfortunately, a United Methodist, well, not United at the time, but a Methodist Episcopal North ordained elder named John Chivington. Chivington was assigned to the Kansas Annual Conference. And on the outbreak of the Civil War, he gave up his pulpit, but not his orders, in the Methodist Church, and joined the Union Army, and became an officer. And he led a successful campaign against the Confederate forces in the West, bringing supplies across from California to Texas. He was considered a hero. And upon returning to Denver, they made him the commander of the Colorado Volunteer Cavalry. The governor told Chivington to go and remove all hostile natives. Here is the perception of what happened, according to white history. Sand Creek Battleground, 
November 29th and 30th, 1864. Not much of a battle, really. They started off at dawn. Cavalry Regiment on the move. All the little ones were asleep. Most people were not awake, but they felt the ground shaking. They began to be scared. Black Kettle ran out and raised the American flag and the white flag. And Chivington ordered his people to attack. And they killed everyone they could see. They killed women, they killed children. There's one account of men taking target practice on a little boy along the creek bed, as young as three years old. And they were missing him. So a sergeant walked up and said, this is how you kill an Indian. Took three steps closer, fired and shot the child. And then took his scalp. Now on that supposed battle, there were those who did not go in and take part in the massacre. There were there was one regiment of normal of regular troops, and their officer did not order his men in. And he wrote letters to the chain of command describing the massacre at Sand Creek. And he advocated that Chivington be removed, and he told them of the travesty that it was. And for standing up and telling what was true and what was right, he was murdered in the streets of Denver several months later. What started in Sand Creek didn't stop there. They drove the people of the Northern Arapaho and Northern Cheyenne all the way up the Rockies from Southern Colorado all the way into Wyoming. And finally, they were accepted to rest on the Shoshone Reservation in Western Wyoming. And there they remain to this day. So the Northern Arapaho were driven from their home and then were sent to share a reservation with someone else, who, as you all know, sometimes aren't your friends. They don't share your culture, don't share your values. And so that was where we were at for many years. One town over from where this monument stands is the town of Chivington. They named a city after him. Mm. And I can tell you that David Wilson was not impressed. He was very upset whenever we drove through there. So now we fast forward to present day, or closer to the present day. There's a man named Ben Ridgely of the Northern Arapaho people. Knowing the history um, of what happened, you get the next slide again. Because this is an elk skin that his grandfather painted. And that elk skin resides at the Cody Museum in Cody, Wyoming. He painted that as a uh, depiction of the history of what happened there. You can see all the devastation that occurred. So, Ben decided to find out where this happened. And he began to drive weekly from Riverton, Wyoming, all the way down to the side at Sand Creek. He began to advocate for finding and setting aside this spot as a historical spot to recognize it as someplace sacred and special. And through years and years of work, he finally got the National Park Service to do an archaeological survey. And they found that it was not one site, but many sites 
all the way up the creek of where fighting took place as the, the troops chased them. I, like you, might not have known any of this except for the fact that I'd watched and, and studied some things. So I knew of some of this history. But then whenever I moved from Texas to Wyoming to become a licensed local pastor in Douglas, Wyoming, I was brought to light to me at our annual conference that this is what the history and what our connection as Methodists was to this tragedy. And so began the process of creating an act of repentance with the Northern Arapaho and Northern Cheyenne. And so our annual conference took it upon itself to add a resolution to their annual conference and to carry out an act of repentance with the people of the Northern Arapaho and Northern Cheyenne. This was not an easy thing for the Northern Arapaho especially to sit down at a table with people who call themselves Methodist because they knew Chippington was a Methodist. They know what their history is. And so in 2014, at our annual conference, all of our annual conference, got onto 14 large buses, went to Sand Creek. We had an act of repentance with the people of North Arapaho and the Northern Cheyenne. And we began a conversation. We knew about their annual healing walk and run. They go every year to the site and they begin to walk and run, usually the young people of the tribes, to run from Sand Creek to the Capitol building in Denver. They stop along the way to honor that young officer who gave his life to tell the truth. They stop again on the corner where he was killed. Then they go to the state uh, capital steps and hold a rally there to again remind people that there are treaties that are not fulfilled, that there are wrongs that were committed that need to be addressed. Now on my bus that we went to Sand Creek on, that was myself and my daughter who was at the time 14, and also David Wilson, and also um, Ben Ridgely, the Northern Arapaho who had founded all of this, who started the whole process going. And I began to talk to Ben, and we traded contact information. And um, I invited him. I said, if there's anything that we can do in Douglas, Wyoming, for you, Please let us know. And so then when it got closer to the annual run, I called again and said, Ben, is there anything that we can do for you? We're right on the interstate, easy on, easy off. Be happy to fix you whatever you would like. And he said, our people are meat and potato people. We, we, we're good with hamburgers and hot dogs and potato chips and water. And so... I went to my people, this was 10 days before, and we had someone that donated the beef, we had somebody that donated everything, and our church hosted 140 of the delegates of the Northern Arapaho people on their way to Sand Creek. And that was just us recognizing our neighbors. That was us trying to show the kindness that wasn't shown to them before. And the strength of the people were that they came to a Methodist church on the day, the very anniversary of the massacre, and sat down and ate with us. And that takes a level of forgiveness. It takes some grace to do that. Now, if you like the next slide, please. Yeah. The feather and the leaf. Now, Whenever uh, my daughter and I were discussing all of this um, at the annual conference, um, believe it or not, I'm a bit of a poet, not much of one, but 
This is what she and I came together on in these words. And it was at the prayers of all the people for the souls of those killed at Sand Creek. And we thought of the image of an eagle flying, carrying the prayers closer to heaven. The flapping of the wings became a wind, and that wind blew through heaven, rustling the branches of the tree of life. So we drew a picture of the tree of life in heaven. And then its leaves, moved by that wind, fell to the earth to begin the healing of all the people. And then at the bottom we drew a leaf and a feather. The prayers of the people and the gift of God for the healing of the nations. The leaves of the tree of life. And again, that's not the end of the story. Because the story goes on forever, does it not? Once a conversation has begun, understanding can take place. But we have to understand, too, that there has to be first, just like we have our conversation with God, we have to have repentance. Does anybody know the difference between repentance and reconciliation? Reconciliation are two equals coming together. Repentance means you owe something. When we recognize our sins, we are supposed to turn away from them and look to God. And so the Rocky Mountain Annual Conference did that. And this year at our annual conference, we received several messages from several different people in the Northern Cheyenne tribe as well. They've had a lot of fires. They don't have a lot of fire equipment. So the annual conference started raising funds to buy them, help them buy a fire truck and a shed and all the things that go with it to help fight fires. Again, conversations lead to communication, lead to understanding, and eventually lead to healing. One day it's my hope in my prayer, that we will hear the hymns of the Northern Arapaho and the Northern Cheyenne song in the Methodist Church. That would be my hope. And with God's grace, that will happen. So we hope that as we pray for our missionaries who go forth and speak to people all around, that that's what we will add to our people. That we as Methodists can reclaim our mantle as sharing the good news and of sharing the good things of God with the world. I know a lot of people have a lot of questions, so I'm known for my brevity, if you'll notice. I'm good, right? I'll need some questions. Uh, sometime open for questions and answers because I know some people have questions. So if you hit the next slide, I think that's the end of it. I'll just put those four together. So if anybody has any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them now. The Sand Creek is located exactly where? Um, it's uh, located near a small town. It's actually 10 miles outside of the small town of is it Chivington and what? I think it's La Hanta. La Hanta, yeah, I think so. But it's uh, it's east of Pueblo, Colorado. So it's in Colorado? No, southern Colorado. Oh, Colorado. Yeah, Pueblo is down the southern border close to New Mexico. So if we looked on the map that you were looking at there, you know, it's right there, and mostly in Comanche area is where that was, part of the northern, the northern region of the Comanche, that part of Colorado. So whatever happened to this Methodist? Nothing. The annual conference uh, reinstated him, or never took his orders away. He remained an elder in the, in the Methodist church. Methodist Episcopal Church and a member of the um, Kansas Annual Conference till the day he died. They never pulled his orders. They never punished him in any way. No legal action was taken. No court action was taken. And he lived out the rest of his days in Denver as an influential person. I told you it wasn't a good story. 
Nope. We don't have anything. The church didn't have anything to say about it. Oh, sure they did. They had plenty. They could have done a lot of things, but they didn't. Because they looked at it as clearing out the land for settlers. People who looked like them. And how many people were killed? In the hundreds. Uh, I think they say it's roughly 333, you know, 300s. Um, and uh, to a loss of nine men, I think, uh, of the cavalry. And uh, right now they're still ongoing, returning and uh, reclaiming of the relics that were taken from the victims. They're still in private collections in Denver and around Colorado. They, they, named some they, named a, they named a town, one town west of uh, uh, named Chivington. They named the town after. It's still there. It's still there. Yeah, David was really upset when we drove through there. <clears throat> he got really angry. I really see him angry, but he was he was pretty ticked that they still had some place named after a man like that. And I'm sure he was probably felt it a little deeper because it holds the same orders that he holds as an elder. So there was a lot to repent for. A lot. I keep thinking that I've seen a movie depicting one of those. Uh, if you've seen the movie The Last of the Dogmen, with, uh, is it Tom Berenger? Yeah. Think? Yeah. yeah. And uh, if you watch that one, that's uh, the beginning of that shows a little bit of that. Yeah. In fact, one of the ladies that was, uh, that was helping with the acts of uh, uh, repentance helped write that movie. Uh, she founded the Northern Cheyenne uh, Tribal College and teaches uh, the Cheyenne language. Last of the Dogmen? Last of the Dogmen, yes. I wish I had a movie. We can, Diane has that movie. Yeah, 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 movie. We can pop out. We'll have to watch it. Yeah, yeah, you should. And the annual run still happens every year. And there are, they, I can forward the website and everything to you guys and you can sponsor runners, and that's another thing that we do is sponsor the runners. And many Methodist churches also provide water and, and rest stops and things like that along the way. So it's something that we've taken to heart that it's not just a one-time event, but this is an ongoing attempt to rectify what's wrong. And what they, whenever they got their chance to speak at our annual conference, they were very much wanting to remind all of us that there were many treaties that are yet unfulfilled. And so that was what we as a conference are now challenged with. And that's what we're hopefully going to be working on. And that run, is that to, uh, to raise money? Or? No, it doesn't. No, you, we raise money for the runners. Okay. The runners themselves, it's the, they, they, it's the healing run and walk. It's supposed to help better the understanding of what happened and keep the memory alive of what happened until things are made right. How many, how many miles do they actually run? Um, it takes two days of running. Um, I, I think it's a total of three days from start to finish because they spend one day in Denver. So it, it's a long ways. I mean, it was, a, I want to say, it was a three-hour drive, four-hour drive, so it would take a long time to run it. Was that like in November? Yeah, it was November. I remember November 29th is uh, the date that it happened. In November, in November in Colorado is pretty cold, and a lot of the stories are that you know, there were there were um, grandmothers and things like that that um, told their children about how they couldn't sleep without moccasins on because they were still afraid they'd get woke up again and they wouldn't have their moccasins. So it was something that really has weighed heavy on the people of the Northern Arapaho for a long time. But there was nobody left in that Mexico. Oh, yeah. They, yes, they got pushed all the way up into Wyoming. Yeah. How does this compare to Custer? How's it compared to Custer? Yeah, I think Custer also massacred some people. Yeah, that was in uh, Oklahoma. Um, I can't remember what um, Donna would know that one. She takes people out to that site um, whenever she teaches. So I can't remember Washita. the name. The uh, Washita site? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah there was, there, every, just about every tribe has got something like this that happened with the, you know, the Trail of Tears and all the other forced relocations. And this one was just particularly horrible. 
He says there was this beginning massacre that happened. So what are some of the examples of the treaties that are still yet to be met? Well, the, the treaty uh, was for recompense, financial uh, recompense for um, lost livestock and lost goods and things like that. And um, I think there was land involved too. I didn't go and get into the whole treaty what all was included, but did standard things that normally weren't fulfilled. As so far who's, as who's responsible for filling those? Is that the uh, yeah, Secretary part of state or? Part of it's the Colorado state government and part of it's the federal government. And, uh, and that goes for a lot of the other northern tribes. Uh, I don't think the Shoshone have any that are like that. They're, all their trees have been pretty much well kept. Same thing with most of the ones in the north, far northwest. But for the Plains tribes and, of course, the ones that were pushed into Oklahoma, a lot of treaties were never fulfilled. And then, for instance, the, uh, the, the Northern Rampo never got their own reservation. They were promised that. And they never got that. They, they just left them on the Shoshone reservation. And the Shoshone didn't like that at all. You know? so, so imagine that, being a stranger in a strange land and, on top of that, being forced to live with People who don't want to be there and people who don't want you there, you know. So uh, you know, they were beat up pretty bad. You know, it was a pretty rough situation. Yes? Was there even any pretense of trying to, uh, supposedly trying to find those that assassinated, of Shivington's men that no, assassinated no. Silas? No. It's unsolved. It never will be solved. They didn't even make a pretense of it. Not really, no. It was all about money and power. It was about gold and silver and land and bringing in settlers. And, and what's sad is that the governor who had this climate of that type of behavior was also a Methodist. Yes, yes he was. And uh, that was one of the problems that they had with uh, doing anything with the Methodist conference or the Methodist church because one of the major churches in Denver was basically built with the money taken from the land that they stole. So yeah, it's a difficult conversation to have, but one that needs to be done. So. And isn't there a Methodist school named after John Evans? Down Evanston, Illinois, I think. Oh, that's, that's Evans. This is Chibbington, C-H-I-V-I-N-G-O-T. No, I mean John Evans, the governor. Oh, the governor, yeah. I, I can't remember if there is or not. So he came out unscathed. Oh, yeah, everybody came out unscathed. I mean, they put up the thing that said it was a ballot. I mean, they, 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 they whitewashed it completely, you know. They, they didn't, uh, even though the records clearly stated that the, mil you know, the military records clearly stated that it was not a battle of any significance at all. So. Is this going to start being taught in school correctly? Huh. <laughs> uh, uh, I doubt it. I mean, most of that part of history has always been washed over. Um, the influence of all the tribes on a lot of the different things that happened in American history are hardly ever taught until you get into upper level. And I'm, that's me speaking from my <coughs> Bachelor of Science in History, sorry. <laughs> so I have a BS in History, and a lot of this doesn't get taught. Um, I think it should be. I think it should be taught just like the German people have to be taught about the Holocaust. I think our, all of our people should know the history of what happened. Because again, Let's it repeat itself. Yes. I'm in college uh, right now taking World History II, mm -hmm. which is from, uh, I believe it's from 1800s up until like 1960. Mm -hmm. And we're in there, but we're talking about a lot of the stuff right now. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff I did not know, you know, even though I'm Native American, I didn't know. And it's just heartbreaking to, to learn it and to read it from the teacher spouting it out like, mm -hmm. it's going to be a beautiful day. It's the same context. We just filling out is the lives were changing, you know, things happen. Mm -hmm. Well, another thing that even even in a presentation that I saw um, that Donna Pilo did, actually, because um, she was giving the history of the Oklahoma uh, Missionary uh, Conference for our class in, in uh, Wesleyan tradition. And she also mentioned the founding of schools. Well, unfortunately, a lot of those schools were just as bad as anything else for abusing kids and not, not continuing and, and eradicating the culture. Because a lot of times they wouldn't allow people to speak in their native tongue and they wouldn't allow them to uh, 
continue in their culture at all. And if they didn't, they were severely beaten or severely injured. One woman had her finger cut off as a little child for speaking in her native tongue. And uh, so, yeah, we have a lot. Like, again, even even when you say, well, we, we put up schools, well, the schools are not necessarily a good thing that we did either. So we have a lot to look back on because we, again, saw someone and we didn't see them. My thing, yeah. <clears throat> I was thinking about putting that marker where, where, where it is as to remind and remember was in your position to doing that. Well, now, now there's a whole, now that, that, that marker is still there. Um, but now there's a whole park it's part of the National Park Service. So they have a whole cultural center there. They have the proper signage. They have a trail that goes up along the top of the ridge, but not down into the creek bed because they consider that sacred ground. So they don't allow just any visitor to go down there. And so the you know, native people can go down and they can leave prayer um, feathers and things like that on the side that nobody else is allowed to go down. Did they have any trouble trying to get it started on the government? Say, we, we don't rep, we don't oh, it, yeah, it was a fight. He was he was driving back and forth. Uh, the, ben originally drove back and forth for years and years and years and years to finally get the archaeological study done to actually pinpoint where it really happened. Because that, that marker was just the closest place to the road. It wasn't really a, it didn't mark where anything happened, actually. So now they have a, 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 a walkway that goes along the ridge with stopping points that have geographical um, markings of where they found relics and where they found the evidence of the battle that as it went down the creek as a massacre occurred. And, uh, as a, and, and, and then collated it with the stories of both the Arapaho. Well, those people that were killed there, were they not buried in that area? Or do you know? Well, it took them three days to finally gather everybody up and bury them and everything else. So, yeah, they, they had a mass grave. Yes, sir. <coughs> Excuse me. This, this isn't so much a question as an observation. Or would you agree with me that the uh, fact of of uh, Mr. Reverend Chivington being uh, a, a Methodist and supposedly a Christian provides us with a, uh, a real-time example, with an example of what we in real time even now can do when we separate our Christianity from our other activities. Yes, exactly. Um, the, another class I was taking, same class I was taking with Donna, about um, Wesleyan tradition going back to the 1700s. Um, if you are a Methodist and you believe in Wesley, the first rule is do no harm. The second one is to do good. The third one is to stay in love with God. If you can do those three things, you're in good shape. If you did none of them, how can you say that you're doing good if you're not even honoring the treaties of your government and not seeing innocence and not seeing your brothers and sisters in, in God right there in front of you. But that is the, the lesson of history. Every time that we put labels on each other to minimize humanity, we allow ourselves to act inhumanly to them. If you notice the first thing that Hitler did was the Jews are the cause of all our evils. They're not like us. They look different. They talk different. They're less than human. That's always the route it goes. They're less than we are, so we can treat them any way we want to. That's not the case. So the lesson we have to remember and learn is even as Methodists, we can be blinded by our current context and our current culture. We can say the same thing about racism. We can say the same thing about all the different things that happen in our country and around the world. If we were adhering to what we believe, or what we say we believe, then there would be no room for hatred. There would be no room 
for judging people based on exterior issues or differences. We are the human race. Any other questions? 